Pepper Corey. I live in Beaufort, North Carolina, but I'm here today as an ambassador for Studio E Fabrics. Studio E Fabrics is a division of Jaftex. Jaftex is a company that goes back four generations, and my boss, Scott Fortunoff, in the back with the suit coat, and his associate and brother, Greg, in the corner, Greg Fortunoff, who does a lot with media, and also Vanessa Dennison over here who is taping this. There are other people in the audience who are reps for this company, and I hope that you know the name of your Studio E or blank rep, and uh, we'll get to know them. This was about marketing, and that's why I hope that this schoolhouse is so full. I'm quite astonished and gratified. Uh, before we roll into the thing about marketing, though, I do want to show you a few things that have been done with Studio E Fabrics. This tunic with the small sleeves is a new pattern by Amy Berrickman, who is Indigo Junction Patterns. And she made this in the peppered cotton that's called Plum and she did beautiful machine embroidery. It looks like hand quilting on the front of it. So she dropped that by for us to show you that the peppered cottons, which I had a little bit to do with, are, uh, she likes them and she makes up her samples in them. Okay. And I always like to show you how I have used the peppered cottons recently. I am so happy that these are now available. They came out last year, the 108 inch wides, and now I don't have to seam my quilt backings, which I adore. And there is a new apron pattern out by Janet Clark from England, a big wraparound apron, uses two yards for each side. That's a four yard fabric sale, God bless her. Uh, <laughs> and that lays out beautifully on these 108 inch wide things. So I know that we always think of these as quilt backings, but they can turn into real money savers for your uh, customers as well. And of course, things like drapes and curtains, which require large yardage. Okay, speaking of large yardage, uh, potpourri, which is a digital print, is 108 inches wide. Potpourri, <laughs> which is a digital print, is 108 inches wide. And I think it's one of the best bargains on the market. I think your price is about $8 a yard, is that right? So, and the nice thing about the, the digital stuff is that there's a clarity to the printing which we haven't seen in a long time. So this technology is evolving all the time. So potpourri comes in these shades and makes excellent quilt backs but also larger scale projects. Now there are a few um, things I'd like to show you. One of the things about peppered cottons is that they're shot cottons. If you're not familiar with shot cottons, it means one color is warped on the loom and another color is the weft, the back and forth. They show as a solid color, but because of the two colors that interplay within a shot cotton, they match a great many more things. So this is a shot cotton that is actually made out of a, a screaming bright lime green and of all things a navy blue. And it, and it knocks itself into a whole new color, okay? Uh, there, are five, there are five colors in the peppered <laughs> cotton lines that are not shot cottons, meaning not two color. Black, which is called deep space, and it's the blackest black you're gonna see. White, white sugar and a bright red, which we call flame, and a true blue, which is called true royal, and then a bright yellow buttercup. So we have the three primary colors and black and white that are not shot cottons, not composed of two colors. But the rest of the line, and there are 50 colors in the line, are actually composed of two colors. And when you look closely at the warp and weft, even on these tiny little cuts, and you pull them away, a thread or two away, you see that this lavender is actually composed of deep purple and pale blue. How did that happen? I'm not sure, but our eyes see it as an almost iridescent lavender. So 
Working with shot cottons and being able to represent them has been a real treat for me. So I'm working in a new uh, style, I guess. I've always been influenced by Asian work, and uh, I'm going to ask Andy to stand up because if she puts her hands in her pockets and sort of illustrates it, that is sashiko, which is Japanese hand quilting. Okay, and that apron is a very easy pattern. It's downloadable free on the internet, but you may sell it in your store. It would be called a chef's apron. And with all the emphasis on food right now, food aprons for both men and women are really coming back into fashion. So the Asian stuff is still with me. And now I'm doing something called kintsugi. And kintsugi means mended with gold. And um, <clears throat> Having taught for 30 plus years, I have a lot of samples. <laughs> and I've never thrown any one of them away. So a kintsugi quilt is where you bring together mended bits and pieces. Uh, the phrase mended with gold came about because a shogun of Japan broke his most favorite teacup and he sent it back to the potter to be mended and it came back with staples in it. He hated that. He sent it to a jeweler and it came back with veins of gold. And now kintsugi means that which is mended is more beautiful than the original object. On the back is one of the 108s, though this is obviously not 108 inches long or wide, but isn't it nice not to have a seam when you quilt? The long arm quilter called me up and she said, I don't believe it. And I said, believe it, just bring me the extra. And she said, I thought you'd forget that. And I said, no. <laughs> No, no, it's, co it's coming back with me. So kintsugi means I've been gathering up all my bits and pieces and making new quilts from them. So that's what's happening with me, and I can bring you up to date on that. Uh, you can often find me in the Colonial Needle booth or the people at uh, a studio you will know where I am. Now, many people assume that marketing and advertising are essentially the same thing, all right? I mean, they're both about selling, aren't they? Aren't the terms interchangeable? The answer is no, and you as a shop owner need to understand that. You pay for advertising. It can be print such as newspaper, magazine, online ads, or even a billboard along the highway. But in fact, paid advertising is only one subset of marketing. Marketing is every way in which you and your shop touch, affect, and attract customers. Marketing also includes public relations. Hmm. How does your shop look? What is your shop's reputation? What does your shop's Facebook page look like? Are you controlling what's said on that page? Are you minding it every day? It's like having a garden. You, can't, you cannot walk away from that. Cannot. Customer support is also part of marketing. So how fast can you turn around a mail order request? If you do something overnight, and the customer is pleased and hops on Facebook to say so, that's solid gold, okay? Um, how do you satisfy the inquiries of a person who's shopping for their first sewing machine? Is everyone who's on your floor uh, proficient with what that sewing machine can do? Can they talk to a new and nervous customer? Uh, if, if they can't, you need to get them to the right person. You know, if the broader definition of marketing sounds confusing or overwhelming, I apologize, but I believe when it comes to advertising, we've been putting too many eggs in one basket. We need to be very picky about print ads. If your store has no products that you yourself design and kit, you have no business advertising in a trade journal, okay? Uh, as to national magazines, picking the right magazine to advertise in just got a whole lot easier because Quilter's newsletter is no more and Block from Missouri Star and the new folk art magazine, Quilt Folk, do not carry ads. So you have a much more limited amount of print that you need to deal with. Um, the dearth of effective print advertising has brought to light a new truth about how we sell ourselves and it's this. We need to take more responsibility for marketing our stores and our products. And I'm sure some of you are kind of squinting right now and saying, I'm too damn busy to do that. Okay, we understand. But fabric manufacturers market on a number of levels. 
they take out ads in trade publications because you are their demographic, you, the shop owners. You are the person they're aiming to interest. But at the other end, fabric companies have to spend money and advertise in consumer magazines to stir the pot that way, to get people interested in finding that fabric and hopefully coming to your store. So they are spending money in two directions in marketing. Marketing is very rough for manufacturers. It's kind of like knowing when to plant flowers for the bees and at the same time setting up a hive to attract the bees. You have to do it all the time and at both ends of the process. Before you ask yourself silently, what is this person talking about? I'm here to ask you to think about what you are marketing in your own store, how you are marketing. We've just eliminated print advertising from the conversation. If that's gone out of that. What are some things that you might do on a daily basis that could attract and sustain interest? So we'll consider the usual incentive that a fabric rep uses when showing you a line. And look here at the back of the fabric card, not on that one, and available as a handout, if you make this quilt, it will sell the line. That's the usual thing that a fabric rep will say. You have to make a sample quilt. Timing is everything there. When the line comes into your store, do you have the time to make that sample quilt? Do you like what the fabric company has suggested? That line, make it and display it and they will buy it, sometimes sells the line. But there's that time factor. And when the focus print runs out, and it will if you haven't ordered two of the central fabric, such as the panel or the big print that holds the line together, can you justify the lack of that all-important print by pointing to the sample quilt on the wall and say, now just imagine this, you know, imagine the quilt without the center panel. <laughs> that, is, that is far beyond the capacity of most of our customers. Now, while some fabric lines will sell very well if you make the suggested quilt, there are other times that smaller, easier to make uh, things can be samples and be what I call spokes fabrics for the line. So here are three suggestions she says. The first is a particular display area that is limited as to its size and weight. It's a place in your store that's really difficult to decorate and everyone has them. Can you guess? Here's a hint. Long, thin, narrow spaces that get a lot of use and people see them but it's hard to hang stuff on them. What do you think I'm talking about? What's on the front of the bathroom? we hope, in your store. There it's it, door. Okay, it's doors. Door spaces are usually ignored in a store because they're difficult to deal with. And if you hang a display rack or pegs or something, the motion of the door dislodges it all the time. And you have broken things and you're always having to repair it. However, if you make a small sample that has one, two, three blocks in a row, make sure it's non-directional, put a border on it and quilt it and hang it. You might call it, what, for your table. You might call it a runner. I call it a door quilt. So it's the perfect thing to hang vertically on a door. And if your line that you're trying to help along has more than one colorway, you can make one block in each of the colorways also but they will coordinate because as you know, the colors will carry through from the different ways. Small but effective areas for display. And they can be as simple as the three blocks. Now the second marketing opportunity is what's called a set display. It's the always inviting set the table scenario. It's a little table with room for only one place setting. And it's pretty, you know, it's got a little tablecloth on it, it has a one mat, it has one fabric napkin and maybe your grandmother's cup and saucer or something like that on it. I have seen stores that have a set display like this and they never change it. It is like a tribute to your grandmother. Now, I, okay, you love your grandmother. However, that is the perfect way to use three different fabrics every month and for every holiday to set the little table differently making a different tablecloth, one mat, and one napkin. And people will enjoy seeing the changes. They'll know where that display is in the store. Go over to the corner. She's got that little tea party thing set up. 
but she'll see something different. It's not a whole quilt, but it gets some new fabrics out in front of you. And that's a small reminder to your customer that these fabrics are not just for quilts. They're for household linens and use as well. Uh, I've had people come into quilt stores and look around and say, do you use these for anything but quilts? Before you go, duh, and beat your head against the table, think about it is that they really only see the top of that display. So, um, so if you'll regularly change and update your set the table scenario, it signals subtly that what you make with these fabrics doesn't have to be a masterpiece quilt. Household linens make good gifts. They'll get used and eventually used up. And what does that mean for you as a fabric seller? They will come in again for more. If those tablecloths and mats and napkins were a hit, they'll be back next Christmas. The third marketing opportunity I learned about quite by accident when I had a shop. I had two fabrics that would not sell. Wild Hawaiian style prints in bold colors that today might be popular, but believe me, they were not popular then. I needed to do something with those dogs. <laughs> Aha. Because the western sun always came in the two windows of the fabric room from about 2 to 6 p.m., I kept long tie-back curtains at the windows. And then 2 to 6, I closed the curtains so the fabrics wouldn't fade. I thought, look, I've got all this Hawaiian fabric. So I made long drapes. And people started to come in and look at those. And the sun came through the bright fabrics. Within two weeks, I had sold both bolts of the Hawaiian fabrics. And one day I rounded the corner into the fabric room and these two women were bidding each against each other for the curtains. <laughs> because that's all that was left. So the idea here is it's stealth marketing. Use a fabric someplace in your store. Don't even reference the price. Just use it. Uh, which leads me as to why I'm wearing this apron. I really do wear aprons, both when I teach and at home. My cooking style is something like that of the Swedish chef. You remember the character on the Muffets, the Swedish chef? And there'd be flour and eggs all over the place. Well, I'm like that. And I've been wearing kitchen aprons for years to protect my clothes. When I'm working, teaching quilting, I often wear an apron too. I make sure the apron has pockets so I can take my ruler or thimble or whatever around with me. Recently, I've begun to realize that my aprons are perfect vehicles of the stealth marketing concept. Note that such an apron needs to be made from fabric you have on hand and want to sell. These two, the green and the gray, are from the peppered cotton line. So the apron is completely lined. And this actually does two things. It teaches an apron class and an embroidery class at the same time. Tomorrow morning from 8 to 9.30, my class, How to Teach Hand Embroidery to Modern Quilters, is full. And that's what we're going to do. So I'm really pleased about that. So aprons, OK. Now, aprons, oh my god, frilly aprons. The symbol of women kept in down in bondage, uh, you know. OK. I'm a hippie. I'm a 70s girl, OK? Think, think about aprons have been liberated. They truly have. It's not the aprons of our childhoods or our mothers. It's rarely frilly, but rather practical. No longer the uniform of the professional housewife, aprons are worn by men and women. When I was a young woman, think 1970s, aprons fell out of favor. Women begin looking beyond the house and family for fulfillment. The feminist movement began. And if you did see an apron, it was often emblazoned with sarcastic phrases. Like, for this, I went to college for four years. Or, hand over the chocolate, no one gets hurt. And then there's my southern favorite that I bought in Brasstown, North Carolina, at the place where they lower the possum in a cage on New Year's Eve. Possum, the other, other white meat. <laughs> I actually have an apron with that on it. I love the fact that aprons are once more in fashion, and they are of every different shape. Andy and I are wearing the chef's aprons styles. These can be lined and can illustrate on the pockets different sort of needlework techniques. Greg is modeling an apron, and the pattern is four corners. At the right corner, he's got the, the pattern is actually pinned to it. It is a popular apron, and uh, 
it also is completely lined. It will illustrate too. The new digital prints are what uh, are the lining on that. Okay, and where's where's the other? You know the other digital. There we are. Thank you. Come on, strut. <laughs> Why don't you come over and stand by Greg, because your apron is actually the same. Now, you are our new rep for, is it Wisconsin? It is. OK, and your name is? Julie. Julie, new rep for Wisconsin. And she is modeling the same apron, but in a different colorway. Peppered cottons plus the potpourri line. But in the back, Scott has on the apron that I really want you to take notice. OK, it says, keep calm and quilt on. Don't be embarrassed. One of the things I want to reassure you about is that Studio E is not going anyplace. Can Scott come up here? Can, Can Scott come up here? I'm sure he will. He's a very good sport. <laughs> Studio E is not going anyplace. We're in it for the long haul, and peppered cottons have been in production for three years, and we plan to keep making them. So keep calm and quilt on. For those of you that have embroidery machines, the use is really nice on that. These are three small suggestions. <laughs> hey, when your boss does that, you know, you know you're with a, a good company. Can I take any questions from people in the audience about marketing? Or do they have anything that they'd like to comment on about our products or things we could do better? This dialogue about marketing was not mine to begin with. Scott started it with a blog. And he asked the readers of his blog to get with him about how could you market your, your fabrics better? So here we are at Quilt Market, selling you fabric that most people use primarily for quilts, but telling you that there are a great many other ways that you could market the fabric. When you make aprons for your store, don't make them all one color. Allow the employees to pick their own colors, but as long as they're from your stock that you know that you can get. Change them all the time. These are small objects that, discounting the hand embroidery, this apron took about an hour and 30 minutes to make. That's pretty darn good. So if someone's wearing an apron in your store, they're probably one of your employees. Do we have some, uh, I think we have, OK, Janice has them. Yay, we have some things to give out to you. And if you see me and you want to talk about marketing concepts, I'm at your service. Thank you very much.